Sorry. All right, cool. Thank you. Well, hello everyone, and welcome to this session on handling secrets in cloud-based applications. I'm Steve Roberts, a developer advocate at Amazon Web Services, where I specialize in .NET and PowerShell on AWS. So let's get right into it. Um, nearly every application, developer, build system, whatever it is, handles secrets of some form, okay? Multiple times a day, usually, 724 throughout the year. And some typical ones that you might think of immediately are things like, you know, connection strings, to databases, passwords, encryption keys, SSL certificates, third party API keys. Now, I also consider things like application and development credentials as secrets. I obviously don't want those to get out into the wild. I just saw a hand get raised. Does somebody have a question, Bill? No, I'll carry on. Um, I should add, by the way, my colleague Bill is on as co-host. So if you have any questions, put them in the chat and he'll answer them as we go along. So anyway, where was I? So yes. So I consider development and runtime credentials for my app as secrets. Um, now for most workloads, you know, secrets vary by environment. You know, we have staging environments, production environments. Those secrets need to be deployed, protected somehow, locked down. So only the right applications, environments, systems, and users can access them. Right? And we need to obviously rotate them on a regular basis. Now, all of this leads to some fairly inconvenient ways of working. So we need to find some convenient ways of, of doing this. Otherwise, we're just going to let the secrets get stale and we're not going to bother to protect them. Now, in this session, I'm not going to cover every kind of secret um, there is. Um, firstly, we wouldn't have time. And secondly, I just don't have expertise in all of them. So I designed the session around a core set of questions that I get asked quite frequently when I'm out presenting to user groups. Um, now, a couple of extra disclaimers. I work for Amazon Web Services, so my focus is going to be on the AWS cloud. But overall, the ideas are applicable to other um, languages, other cloud uh, providers, etc. In fact, if you saw, I think it was Ryan or Ryan Johnson's uh, session yesterday, uh, he was showing how to protect secrets in Azure. I was also, uh, as it says on my bio, a .NET developer at AWS. So. You know, that's my tool set of choice. But again, the ideas I'm presenting, the APIs, the services are applicable no matter what language you use on AWS. So what solutions have we used in the past, right? Why is this such a big deal? Well, you know, we used to hard code them in the source and configuration files, right? We put secrets in there. Now you might think nobody does this, but it still happens today. You still see people check uh, credentials into GitHub. Uh, and it usually happens because we have the best of intentions, right? We're doing a quick and dirty fix or we want to test something out, or you start work on a new project, and you think, yeah, I'll, I'll, fix the, I'll fix the credentials later on, I'll fix the secrets later. The problem is they tend to stay there, right? You never underestimate the power of human laziness and memory, right? So it's always best to start out from best principles if you can. Now, traditionally with .NET applications, you know, um, we would store secrets in like app settings and connection strings in the app config or web config files, and we'd do transforms on them at build time. So we get different credentials or different secrets for different environments. Um, we'd encrypt them using machine keys. Fine, that usually worked okay for to, you know, the traditional monoliths that are running on a limited number of servers in a data center or your office. The problem is though that those keys, those secrets still end up in your source code repository. And then at some point you decide to open source and guess what happens? The other problem is that to update the secret, you, know, you had to go in and hand, hand edit all those files on the servers. That's great if you have a limited number of servers, but when you go to cloud scale, that just does, that is just isn't feasible. And then what happens when you're using serverless, where you don't have access to the host, you can't get to the machine, okay? So some other ideas people have used is environment variables. Okay, it's better than hand putting them into your source code, but when you're running apps on VMs or containers, you know, you might have to restart that app or the VM or respawn the container so that new environment variables get picked up. And you also mean, you know, you need to have a build process to set those variables correctly. That's somewhere else we're going to want to secure things. So, you know, in summary, those traditional solutions, and I put traditional in quotes, is, you know, they're either not secure at all, you know, or they have operational overhead. So how can we do things better? So let's start by going to absolute ground level and start protecting the credentials that we use for our developers or our development processes and our apps in the cloud, right? Let's keep those credentials out of the source code config files, but not put too much of an inconvenience in the way, right? I always say security is one over convenience, right? So if we make things too hard, our developers will probably potentially try and work around things, and then we start to get problems and leaks. 
Now, I want to be clear that the credentials I'm talking about here are AWS access to secret keys. These are programmatic keys, like third party API keys. Other providers have similar notions. So, you know, what I'm about to say still applies. So before we begin, let's sort of define what I mean by application and development credentials. So I like to distinguish the credentials that I use to develop and deploy my application from those that the application needs when it's running. Now on my laptop, you know, I store my developer credentials. I use multiple sets of credentials for different accounts. And to be honest, they pretty much all have admin permissions. And the reason for this is that as a developer advocate, I never really know which services from AWS I'm gonna be working with on a day-to-day -day basis when I'm developing samples or I'm talking about things or I'm writing news blog posts. So I use admin credentials there. But when my applications or my samples run in the cloud, they don't need such a wide scope, right? They only access a subset of AWS services or resources. And it's generally a better practice anyway to use different sets of credentials scoped to different sets of permissions for your deployed apps. Now, when I'm talking about development credentials, I include those in the CI CD or continuous integration, continuous deployment development category. Some other developers, they like to use the same credentials like I do. Others prefer to use different credentials. And I've heard some companies go so far as to use completely different accounts for development production build systems. You know, your mileage may vary. The key thing is though, you know, we're not putting credentials into our files, right? And obviously it's still a possible thing. It's still something you can do today. Otherwise I wouldn't be talking about it, but you know, I really can't stress enough how bad of an idea this is. Bots are scanning public repos all the time. They can spot the credentials on a commit very, very quickly. You might even even realize you've done it for some time, right? Until the bill arrives or you wonder what's going on, something worse happens. So let's get these things out of this code. And the way we do it at AWS is we use something called credential profiles. So a credential profile, it's just simply a set of credential keys. We call them access keys and secret access keys that we associate with a name. Now, all of the AWS SDKs and tools can work with credential profiles. They're just held in a file on your machine. What we do is we can put the name of the profile into our application configuration files or our source files, doesn't matter. The thing is when we commit those changes, that name, it means nothing. We're not betraying anything because the credentials are on my machine. They're not in the code. And that's how we can safely and easily work with credentials. Now, as I mentioned, those credential profiles let us work with creds during development without betraying the secrets into our code base. Right? And I may choose to use different credentials on my CI CD setup. I may use the same ones. But what happens when I deploy my app to the cloud and it then needs credentials to run, right? My application is going to want to call AWS services or some other third party. Where are credentials coming from then? So several years ago, uh, when I started AWS, I used to see frequent questions on forums from users asking, okay, I've got my credentials locally and I'm deploying my application to say an Amazon EC2 virtual machine. How do I put my credential file onto the machine, right? And you know, this is a bad idea, right? Um, firstly, when the app runs on that host, it's gonna be running with your development credentials, which in my case would probably be admin, admin privileges. So a much wider scope than the app actually needs. And secondly, should the worst happen and the host get compromised somehow, your dev credentials are now in the wild, right? And again, you might not realize this for a while. So what we need instead is some way to deploy our apps, right, without any credential data at all, and then at runtime get credentials vended to it automatically. So is there a better way? The answer is yes, otherwise I wouldn't be here talking about it. Um, I want to introduce you now to AWS's Identity and Access Management Service, which we call IAM, IAM. So IAM is a service, it's free in your AWS account, there's no extra charge to use this, that enables you to manage access to other AWS services and resources, right? And it has the notion of users, groups, roles, and policies. Now I use several IAM users uh, with long-term credentials on my local machine, and I use those for my development, I use them for my CI CD setup, et cetera. Um, groups, as you might imagine, allow you to group users together for administrative, uh, administrative convenience when applying permissions. Um, so, so far, pretty standard stuff. And that leads me on to roles. So roles can be associated with temporary credentials via something we call a trust relationship. Now that trust relationship allows your application, when it's running on the trusted entity, to obtain time-limited, temporary, automatically rotating credentials. Right? And users can also assume roles. This is not just for applications, but that's what my focus is gonna be on here how to use a role to vend application credentials at runtime. Now, inside our application code, we can also request temporary credentials 
uh, there's a service called secure, um, security token service. You can call to say, hey, given this role, give me some temporary credentials. So you can do things like deploy your app with a role and then temporarily grab other credentials when you need them. You don't have, you're not just stuck with what you uh, deploy your application with. I mentioned that the credentials are temporary and when they expire or when they're about to, if you're using any of the AWS SDKs to communicate with AWS, uh, using that role and the credentials vended from that role, they will automatically handle the refresh for you. You don't have to worry about it. You just keep making your calls. The SDKs will do the heavy lifting. Now, to go with users, groups, and roles, we have something called policies. So AWS has a very, very fine-grained access control mechanism. Um, a policy controls what services can be accessed, what APIs on those services can be accessed or denied, what resources for that service can be accessed, and potentially under what conditions should those rules take effect. Now, by default, nothing is permitted. Instead, you add access. Right? Then you can also deny it if you want. So if you have an allow anything but this scenario, that's supported too. Now, I consider the ability of starting from nothing and building up or adding permissions safer than starting out from an anything goes and scoping down when it comes on to going to the cloud. So you have control of opening the scope of your application. So let's put this together. What does this look like when I'm developing locally and when I then deploy my application to the cloud? And this might look scary, but it's actually quite simple. So first for local development, we have our application. I'm gonna assume here it's a .NET application. So we have an, an application config file. And inside that file, I declare a name of a profile that I want my application to use when running locally. That's a reference to a local file holding my programmatic development keys. These keys are stored uh, so with the user, they're stored on my local machine and attached to that user is a policy or a set of policies that control what that app can use when I'm deploying, when I'm sorry, running it on my machine. Now remember these, these role, these, oh, sorry, these IAM users can also be used inside my tooling. So it controls what I can access from tools. But when I deploy my application to the cloud, things change. So here's my same application. This time, let's say it's running on an Amazon EC2 virtual machine. This time, the application has been deployed with a role. That role has a trust relationship on board, on, attached to it, as well as policies controlling what it can access. The trust relationship vends temporary credentials onto the host that the application can automatically read and consume to start calling AWS services. And of course, the policy is again, what can the application access when it's running? And ideally, those policies are more constricted than what my user in development has. So let's go and take a look at that slide in practice. Um, I'm going to show an application running locally, then we're going to deploy it. Uh, I'm going to take a look at the roles um, that I'm using. So I'm going to jump over to Visual Studio, and here's my very simple application here. And if I go into my application settings file here, you'll see that I've got this AWS section here. And here's where I reference the profile that I want to use for credentials. Now, what do these credentials look like? Well, I'm not going to show you real credentials, but I'll show you where they live. So here's my profile location. You say I have a .aws folder, and here's my real credentials. Let's take a look at an example file. And that's what credentials look like in a profile. It's just access key, secret access key. I can also specify roles. You can see at line 10, um, you can actually assume role through, through credential profiles. I'll shut that window down. So they're pretty simple. Let's go back to Visual Studio. So all I'm doing here is saying I want when this application runs locally, I just want to use the credentials associated with that Steve demo uh, profile. I can check this file into GitHub. No one's going to be any the wiser what those credentials are. Inside my app, I've got uh, I've got a page here, a very simple page, and all it's doing is calling AWS services to just list some Amazon S3 storage buckets and some Amazon EC2 virtual machines that I have running. Nothing uh, particularly clever there. So let's run this app. And when the browser comes up, we should see a list of storage buckets in Amazon S3. There they are. And a couple of Amazon EC2 virtual machines that are running. Okay. Again, very simple app. Don't laugh at me for my UI skills. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to change that profile. So I'm going to use another profile that I've got on my machine. And over here, I've got the Aegis Explorer from the Aegis Toolkit for Visual Studio. And you can see here are all actually my, my real credentials uh, referenced inside here. So let's run that application again. Now, this time I should see different data because I'm using a different account. Uh, 
Okay, so here's my application. And now you'll notice I've got many more Amazon S3 storage buckets. So we're definitely in a different account. And this time I've only got one EC2 image or one EC2 instance while they're running. Okay, so we different accounts. I just changed the name of the potential profile um, inside the app. So now let's deploy this app to the cloud. Now remember that both of those profiles I was using locally have administrative privileges. Okay, and I don't want that in the cloud. I'm going to, so I'm going to deploy it with a role. And what I'm going to do is deploy this app to a service called Elastic Beanstalk. It's hosting web applications. Now I've already deployed a sample, but um, I'm going to walk you through the wizard again. This comes from our toolkit. Now there's a bit of a chicken and egg here in that I could go and create a role for this sample application and deploy it, but it takes a couple of minutes for the deployment to spin up. So I'm going to deploy it using a role that I've already created. While it spins up the infrastructure, I'm then going to go and take a look at that role, and then I'm going to walk you through how we would create that role um, inside the console. You could, normally, you would do this from infrastructure as code because um, we don't want things to be repeatable and consistent, etc. But the visual through the console is a little bit easier to understand. So let's get started with deploying it, and I'm just going to deploy it out to an environment in Beanstalk, which maps to the EC2 virtual machines it's running on. And here's the crux of the of the deployment. So you'll see I have two roles. And the top role here, this is going to be the deployed app permissions, i.e. what can the application access, and the trust relationship that says when this is running on an EC2 host, it can get temporary credentials. And here's the role that I've already created. The second role here allows Beanstalk, Elastic Beanstalk, to access your resources. Remember I said that AWS is a lockdown environment by default, nothing can be, nothing happened. Here I'm giving, I'm giving permission to the service to say, hey, you can go and get my deployment bundles, my deployment artifacts and do things for me. So I'm going to finish this wizard up, click deploy. So our toolkit's going to build the project for me now, deploy it out to Amazon S3, and then tell Beanstalk, hey, go and stand up the infrastructure to take this simple application. And that's going to take us a couple of minutes. So while that gets underway, let's go and take a look at that role. So here I am in the AWS, AWS Management Console, and I'm going to go to the Identity and Access Management uh, sub-console, if you like. And here you can see I've got groups, users, roles. I'll take a look at some of these in a moment. And take a look at roles. And I have quite a few roles inside here, but the one I'm interested in is this secret sample role. And you'll notice that it has some policies attached. Currently three policies. I'm going to come to this middle one uh, in the last demo, but you'll see that I have a sample EC2 policy here, which allows my application to call describe instances. So that's how we got the list of my running VMs in EC2. And I have a sample S3 policy that allows it to list all my buckets, right? So this, this app is really heavily locked down. I importantly have trust relationships. So here's my trust relationship that says, hey, if this application is running on EC2, then temporary credentials to it. And I can also deploy this app to Elastic Container Service or as a serverless function in Lambda. So that's why I've got the additional uh, trust relationships on there. So a very simple role. And how did I build it? Well, let's go back to roles. And again, normally you would do this from infrastructure as code templates or, or, or actual code itself or using our SDKs. But let's use the console to do it. So I want this app to run on, I want my applications using this role to run on an AWS service. So let's say EC2. Next, I'm going to want to add permissions. Now, there's a couple of ways of doing this. I can search for things like uh, EC2 read-only access. If I take a look at this policy uh, on my screen here, which is shrunk, you'll see that it's got a few more APIs uh, allowed in it that, than I had originally. Or I can do something like adding an inline policy. Oops. Do you know there? Let's go back to where I was. EC2, add permissions. Okay. So instead, I'm going to create a policy. And I'm going to choose the service that, that, that I'm, my application is going to call. So let's say EC2, choose EC2 here. And then I have access to what APIs can I call? So in this case, I only want to call describe instances from my application. But you can see here that I can call any of the, I can select any of the AC, EC2 APIs to be applied in this policy. I can add additional permissions. So let's say I want to also add on the ability in S3 to list all my buckets which is what we just saw in the policy I showed you. So I'll review that policy, and we're going to call it um, demo, demo policy, create it. Okay, so that's been done. 
So let's go back to my role now and start creating a role. And again, EC2 is going to be my trust relationship. And let's search for my demo policy. There it is. Let's select that and attach it to the role. We'll view that and we'll just call it demo role. Now, all that's done is created effectively a JSON template that describes the role and the policies. So again, this is how I would normally do it using IAC techniques, but in the, um, the console's UI, it's easy to, to understand. While we're here, let's take a look at some users. So you see, here's my demo user that I was running with earlier, and you'll notice it has administrator access. Okay, I don't have any groups, otherwise I'd show you those. So let's go back to Visual Studio, which the deployment should be done now. It's finished, okay, so we'll click on the link, start the app. And you can see that, it's, again, it's listing my Amazon S3 buckets, and it's listing my EC2 instances. In fact, there's a new instance arrived here. This is the one that we've just launched, okay? So this is obviously running with credentials from my Steve demo account. Remember that in the code in Visual Studio, on that last run, I changed the actual app settings file to be Steve Dev, which is a different account. That, had, that gave me different data. It doesn't matter that that's in the, in the profile, sorry, in the settings when I deploy the app. The app is just going to determine, hey, that profile's not available. Are there any credentials in my host environment? And let's go from there. So that's how we can protect our credentials when we're working locally. And then when we deploy to the, to the cloud, we're going to use a role. That role will, will uh, vent credentials. So let's head back to the slides. So hopefully that clarifies exactly what happens between local development with credential profiles and deployed applications, right? We don't put credential keys in the code, not even a works for now, fix it later scenario. Start out with the best of intentions. It's really not hard to do. Um, the profile name you put in that code or configuration file, doesn't matter. Check that into GitHub, no one's gonna care. Um, but for deployed applications, always use an IAM role. Don't try and put your credential file on the host um, because in some cases, serverless, for example, that's just not gonna work. You don't have access to the host. Um, as a best practice, scope those role permissions to what's needed uh, and use the trust relationship to say that, hey, when this app is running on this environment, it can get credentials. Okay. Storing secrets in the cloud. So in this session, I'm going to be looking particularly at the top two, systems managers, parameter store, and secrets manager. Uh, I'm not really going to cover key management service and certificate manager, but they are security services of interest that you might want to take a look at. So KMS um, is a fully managed service. It makes it really easy for you to create and manage cryptographic keys, and you can control their, their use and their access using standard access control policies. Um, all the usage of the KMS keys, or the keys stored in KMS, I should say, uh, is logged to AWS CloudTrail. So you can see who used your key, including AWS services. Um, let me see what else I want to say. It's integrated with various other services. So you will see that when we come to look at parameter store and secrets manage, that KMS actually surfaces in those consoles. That's what's used to do the encryption of the data in those services. Any keys that uh, get created on your behalf by AWS are free. Um, but there is a charge for other keys that you create yourself. Certificate Manager, um, this allows you to provision and manage SSL certificates, uh, which you can then apply to other AWS services, such as Elastic Load Balancers, uh, CloudFront Distributions, etc., or even APIs if you're using API Gateway. It automatically handles certificate renewals, and you can also provision your own certificates. It doesn't have to go through uh, private certificates uh, if you need to. That's as much as I'm going to go into Certificate Manager. I am not a certificate expert in any way, shape, or form, um, but I have worked with Parameter Store and Secrets Manager a lot, and that's what I use to protect my secrets in the cloud um, for my applications. So let's go take a look at those. So we'll start with Parameter Store. So this is a subservice of the overall Systems Manager service, um, and it stores key value data. Um, those values can be plain text. They can be a list of plain text strings or they can be secure strings which are encrypted with a KMS key. So I just mentioned KMS. And again, audit trails can track the parameter usage. So you can see who's using your secrets. Um, the, the parameter store is ideal just for getting, not just configuration data, or sorry, I should say not just your secrets, but your configuration data out of your code base. And then recover, recovering it at runtime or build time um, on the fly. Which also means, of course, we've solved the problem now where we're working at scale and we need to change uh, a particular setting or a particular secret. 
instead of having to go try and find all those EC2 virtual machines or all those containers um, and changing the values there and redeploying, we just change it in the service. Now we can also apply a role-based access control to these parameters. Um, we can create individual simple parameters. We can create hierarchies of parameters. Um, we can also, as I mentioned, role-based control, we can set things up so that if we're in a development environment, maybe everybody on the team can access a particular parameter that's holding a database password. But in production, maybe only certain users or certain roles can access it. So it's quite a useful service there. But remember, it stores plain text data as well as secure string data. When we name our parameters, we can use a simple name, my parameter, just a simple string, um, or we can create a hierarchy with a shared root key. Um, we call that a path. We separate the path components with a slash, forward slash. There is a limit of five components or five segments in the path. That gives you a fair amount of flexibility. And there's some use cases shown on this slide. So you can see that uh, a lot of users decide that they're gonna keep separate environments for their parameters and secrets. So a dev environment, a prod environment, here we've got two uh, connection strings for two SQL Server instances, um, one in dev, one in prod. That's one way you can do it. Secrets Manager, on the other hand, is designed for one thing only, storing secrets. Um, but it adds some additional capabilities, so it can automatically rotate secrets. So, for example, database credentials. Um, the rotation mechanism that it uses is extensible. You can deploy serverless functions into Lambda that actually uh, help control or, or take part in the credential rotation process. Uh, and it's integrated with Amazon's relational database service, Redshift and DocumentDB. You don't have to do anything. Again, the secrets are encrypted with uh, KMS keys. Uh, and again, all access is logged. So you can go and see who's taking a look at your, your secrets. But it, it is uh, a chargeable service. Whereas Parameter Store has the notion of standard parameters and standard throughput, which are just free. Um, with the option of uh, additional payment for a higher throughput. With Secrets Manager, it stores the secrets and the API calls to retrieve them. So that's one difference. So, and, and again, a frequent question I get when I'm out talking um, is, you know, which one should I use? Um, so for me, there's three key differences, right? Parameter Store has the ability to store plain text as well as secret data, whereas in Secrets Manager, everything's a secret. Um, Parameter store is free if you use the standard parameters uh, and throughput, whereas Secrets Manager uh, does have a charge to it. Um, and only Secrets Manager can, can rotate um, credentials. And it can also automatically generate random secrets, which Parameter Store cannot. But they're also integrated, though. So I can make calls to Parameter Store to retrieve secrets that are in Secrets Manager. Now, there are some small limitations. One is I have to use a particular reserved path syntax to read that secret. Um, you're not allowed to modify secrets, so you can't write new secrets through the Parameter Store API, um, and there's no versioning. But other than that, uh, it's fairly convenient access, and we'll see that later on. So let's go take a quick look at what Parameter Store and Secrets Manager look like, and then we're going to have a look at how we use them uh, in outside our applications. Uh, again, I'm going to start with the Management Console because it's a visual thing to show in demos, but then I'll also show you how you can work with these from the command line, and that'll become important when we start talking about build build tools. So back to the management console and um, close down, we jump to my console here, close this one off. So I'm going to jump to parameter store, which is in systems manager, systems manager there. And here is parameter store. And what you'll see is I've created some parameters already. So I've got a batch here for my secret sample application. Uh, I have some generated parameters that I'm going to use inside Azure DevOps shortly. And I've got some simple parameters here. Um, so let's take a look at one of these. So let's take a look at this plain text setting here. You can see here's my value uh, associated with that, that uh, parameter. If I go back to one of the secret uh, strings, let's take my secret DB ID, you'll see that it's masked off automatically in the console. And I have to elect to decrypt that, that value. So these at the top here, these uh, parameters at the top, this is what we call a parameter hierarchy. And later on, I'm gonna read all of those parameters with a single call, uh, similar for the build ones here. How do I create a parameter? It's quite easy. And again, I can do this from infrastructure's code. I can do it through any of the APIs uh, for the services using our SDKs. It's very simple. So I just give it a parameter name. Oops, BAME, my parameter name whether I want a standard, which is the free or advanced, which has charges for it. 
and I have the ability to create a string, a string list, or a secure string. And when I choose secure string, notice that KMS now surfaces, right? I can use a key that the service will create for me, which is no charge, or I can use a key from another account, like set my key alias, and here's a secret. I'm just going to store that and say create parameter. So it's really easy to use. Secrets Manager is very similar um, uh, to look at. So let's take a look at Secrets Manager here in the console. So I have two secrets here. Connection string, connection um, for password for a database. Uh, it even gives you the sample code, by the way, that lets you recover in the APIs. Let's take a look at the secret. There's the secret values. And I can edit in here as well. It gives me a nice form to, to fill this out. Internally, this is just held as a blob of JSON. It's encrypted, so here's the plain text version of it. Now, when I create a secret in Secrets Manager, again, remember that everything in Secrets Manager is a secret. I don't get the option to create a plain text field or anything. I can actually wire up credentials for a database. So I can go off and choose my username and password for a database that I have. Uh, I can go and choose the database this will apply to. That will then hook up to the database, recover the endpoint, the connection string, uh, the connection string, et cetera, and store all of that in that consolidated secret for me. I'm not going to do that here, though. What I'm going to do now is, OK, let's go to my console. And remember, I'm a .NET and PowerShell DA, so PowerShell is my command line tool of choice. Um, how can I work with this from my dev machine or from my build system? So firstly, I can look at parameters. Um, Parameter store with a command like called get SSM parameter list. Now, the, for those of you who have not seen our AWS PowerShell tools, let me scroll up briefly for a second. This three letter prefix here is just how we namespace the commands because various AWS services have the same API name. This just lets us have different commands for the same, for different services that have the same API name. And you can see that it's recovering the name of my secrets that we just saw inside the console. Cool, let's clear that. How do I get a particular parameter? Well, I can call get SSM parameter and give it a name. And let's call, let's use one of my build. Um, let's use a plain text setting. I think I had that one in there. You can see it's retrieved the value here of that parameter. I can do the same thing for a secret. So I should call secret one. But notice that the value is encrypted. To actually get the value back, I need to add a flag called with, with decryption. And now I can see the actual value of the secret. OK. Now I mentioned that one of the cool things about parameter store is I can get a whole batch of parameters, get parameter by path. Um, I can get them all in a batch. So here I just give it a path, not that one, slash path, slash build. Now I don't think I actually had any uh, underneath here, but just in case there were any deeper ones, we'll see that what this has retrieved back is all of the parameters that are under the build um, common key, common shared root key. So that's working with parameter store from the command line. And if you're using the AWS CLI, it has exactly the same commands, different names, obviously, it'd be AWS, SSM, I think it is, and then uh, the actual API name, but you can do the same things. I can work with Secrets Manager as well from PowerShell SEC is the command line here, so or SEC is the command line noun. So get SEC secret list gives me back the two secrets that I have held. I can do a, I can call and get a particular secret. I give it the secret ID. So let's look at my example DB secret that I had. And you'll see that this time the value doesn't come back. To do that, I have to call a different command, get SEC secret value. And that brings me back the secret string that is my data. Okay, so why am I showing you these commands? Because when we come to our build system where we want to protect secrets there, we're probably going to want to script some solution to pull secrets down at run at build time, sorry, and maybe inject them into the code that we're building or use them to access resources uh, or other pieces of work. So that's one way you can do this in CI CD systems where you might not have pre built tasks. Okay, back to slides. So we like took a very quick look there at using Parameter Store and Secrets Manager to put secrets and retrieve secrets at runtime or build time. Um, we'll use the console just to have spelunk around, take a look. But more commonly, you're going to be using things like command line tools, AWS Tools of PowerShell or the AWS CLI. Or you might do this from inside your own application, as we'll see later on. 
So now that we know how to work with secrets, uh, they're held in the credentials in, in stores in the cloud. Let's go and see how we can use this inside our build systems. So here I'm talking about things like certificates for code and artifact signing um, or generating new secrets. Maybe my build generates a new uh, password for a database and then wants to store it. Where is it going to put it? Um, the thing with this is, though, that one person's OK is a plain string is another's critical secret. All right. Um, there are multiple scenarios. For example, when we're writing blog posts for AWS, some of the blog post developers think that their uh, account ID is a secret and will blur it out to screenshots. Others don't bother multiple different scenarios. The I mentioned about certificates here is, is an, another example from working on the SDK team. So we digitally sign our build artifacts. So that's our MSI installers, our PowerShell modules, our Visual Studio and VS Code extensions, etc. And we to do that, we use a password protected certificate file. So what we do is we put the password into Secrets Manager. And then at build time on the build server, the build host, we retrieve that secret. It allows us to rotate that secret password if we need to, or if the certificate changes, uh, it's quite easy. We can also limit the credentials that are allowed to access that, that secret to get that password, because we don't want anybody going to our build, build host uh, and grabbing our password and then passing off their work as ours. Um, the PFX file we decided to leave on the build server, arguably we could have just put it into an Amazon S3 bucket again with limited credentials and pulled it down at runtime. So, you know, when we're talking of builds, we're talking not just consumption of secrets, but creation of secrets as well. Um, so let's go and take a look at what we can do with that. And in this particular demo, I've shown you the command line uh, options for working with secrets from PowerShell and AWS CLI, if you're using that. I'm going to take a specific example here of the AWS tools for Azure DevOps. So if any of you are using Azure DevOps and you want to work with secrets in there, um, let's go take a look. Go back in the browser. Uh, I have a very simple project set up in Azure DevOps here. It has no code in it, but it does have a build pipeline. So we're going to take a look at my pipelines. And here it is. And I'm going to edit this. Now, in this particular instance of Azure DevOps, I've got the AWS tools for Azure DevOps installed, and that gives me access to a whole load of tasks for working with various AWS services. I can download content from S3. Maybe I want to download that PFX, that certificate file at build time, fetch the secret from somewhere else, and then use that to do digital signing. Or maybe I want to inject some content into my release builds that my developers don't have access to during on their development machines. That's another scenario. There's a whole bunch of tasks in here. But I've added some into my pipeline here where I'm replicating what I just did at the command line with those, those commands. So this, for example, is retrieving all of the parameters under the build key. And then what it does is I have the ability to then take those values and inject them into my downstream tasks as build variables using the, either the parameter names um, or I can use custom names, etc. I can get value for a single parameter or an entire hierarchy. You'll notice I've got credentials set up here. Where are those coming from? If I jump to new here, this is how I can set up a new service connection. And remember my credential profile earlier? I had the access key, secret access key. I can also use roles. So now I can use roles on my build servers as well. Um, in fact, if I go and take a look at uh, I am on here. I'm going to show you that for my build credentials, if I go to my users here. Here's the credentials I'm using on my build server. You'll notice that the policies only allow me access to parameter store and secrets manager, nothing else, specifically for this demo. So that's one way I can scope down my build server. I can equally get values from Secrets Manager. So I can pull the secret to that example DB connection string data that I've got in there. And again, I can have that injected into my build um, as a name. I should have a couple of PowerShell scripts that just echo this in the build console. We're going to take a look at it in a minute. Uh, I can retrieve secrets. So this was an example of retrieving a secret in Secrets Manager through Parameter Store. This is an example of going directly to Secrets Manager to get the secret. And again, I'm going to output that. And then as part of my build, you know, I might want to create new secrets and store them. So there's uh, options to create secure string uh, values in parameter store, or I can create and update secrets in secrets in secrets manager. So let's run this pipeline and just take a look at what happens.
So we can see the tasks running now. Okay, cool. So here was the first task to retrieve parameters from parameter store. And hopefully you can see this, if I jump this up a little bit in size, you can see that it's reading a parameter hierarchy. So it's pulling down all of those configuration keys that were underneath the common slash build root. And then it's transformed, I elected to transform it. So I've created parameters with these variable names. And notice this one here is secret is true. The way this task works is it knows it's a secure string that it's retrieving. So it creates an automatically masked variable inside the Azure DevOps environment. So all the console logging will be automatically masked. It won't show the value. So again, another way of protecting my secrets. And I made a call to get the data from parameter store, sorry, from secrets manager using, sorry, from secrets manager using the parameter store reference. And then I put those, those values. And notice a couple of things. Now, I, when I was putting this demo together the other day, I looked at this and thought, that's strange, because I was expecting to see this masking applied here. And I think what I've done is I've uncovered a bug uh, in the VS, in our DevOps tools that I'm following up with the, with the service team. But there's an important point to be made here, and that is don't assume that your build environment is secure. Okay, treat it as though it's compromised. And then work back from that as to be, do I really want to echo this to logs? Um, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Again, secrets manager, you can see it's read back the value here. I didn't echo anything out, but in here I've echoed it, the value, and you can see again, it's, it's open. So I'm going to check into that and see if that's actually, I don't believe that's by design. Um, I certainly don't feel that it should be doing it that way, but you know, the way it is right now. Um, here's where it created a secret. So you'll see here, I'm simulating creating um, a database password on the fly and then storing it into uh, the services. And here I'm doing a create update. In fact, let's go and take a look at those two values. We should see two new versions or, or secrets coming out. So here's my generated parameter of my build. You can see it's updated. Uh, I'm guessing it's midnight in the UK right now. It's late afternoon in Seattle. What I did was I put the build number on the back end. So there's my updated parameter. So from my build, I can generate secure strings um, and store them or plain text. In Secrets Manager, we should see that the secret was updated from the build. And if I retrieve the secret value, there's build 23. So again, way of doing uh, automatic generation of secrets. Now, if this was a real database password, I would probably want to make use of Secrets Manager's ability to generate random passwords. Uh, I could use either the Edge CLI to do that or the PowerShell tools, get that value, put it into a parameter and then send it um, to the to the service. So very, very easy to use. Um, thoroughly recommend if, you, if you're using DevOps and you want to work with secrets on AWS, check those tasks out because they make it very, very easy to, to store your secrets and work with secrets inside your builds. All right, back to slides. So as I just said, use the command line tools. Um, if you're using AWS's own CI CD services, so uh, code pipeline, code build, code deploy, you can use the command line tools. Uh, for Azure DevOps, we have specific tasks that I just showed you. And again, to make the key point, begin from the premise that your build host is not a secure environment. All right, so lock down your access to those secrets um, and, and consider, you know, where do you need to show them? How do I need to store them inside my, my environment? So that brings me to the final set of secrets to cover, which are runtime um, secrets that my application wants. So I really want to show how easy this is. Because remember I said earlier on that we, sometimes we start from, we kind of have the best intentions. I'll fix it later. I'll get this secret out of my code before I push it to GitHub. Uh, and then we forget, um, and then we're in trouble, right? So if it's really easy to do, we're more likely to start from a best, best practice or best principles than we are to do the quick and dirty fix and forget about it later. And again, I'm talking about common, common secrets here, database connection strings, passwords, API keys, encryption keys, okay? Should we put them in our app code and config files? I think you probably know my opinion right now. Uh, it's a big fat no, right? Let's start from best practices, best principles. Now, earlier on I showed you using parameter store and secrets manager from the console and the command line tools. Uh, you can also do this inside your application code, and I'm gonna show you it shortly. If you're a .NET developer, though, 
Uh, we have a couple of additional extension libraries that you can use that make this so, so easy. Um, firstly, we have a configuration provider for Systems Manager's Parameter Store. There's a NuGet package listed there and the source code is open source on GitHub. And then we also have a caching, so, um, client-side caching for Secrets Manager. Now remember that one of the differences between Secrets Manager and Parameter Store is that Secrets Manager does, does have a charge associated with it to both retrieve and store. So you not want to be going to hitting Secrets Manager all the time to retrieve that secret. Um, you want to probably going to be caching it. Um, so we have a library for that as well. All the languages though, all the language SDKs that, that uh, AWS Vens, uh, Python, JavaScript, Java, Ruby, you name it, they can all access the AWS uh, service APIs to do the work that these libraries are doing. So you can build this yourself. Um, there's nothing in here that's uh, secret, which is kind of ironic. Um, you could build these libraries yourself, add them to your code, or just call the raw APIs. Um, they're all available to you um, to use. So let's go and take a look at how easy this is. And I think you might be a little bit surprised. Um, so let's go back to my application here. And remember that it's still looking at my uh, profile here. I'm not going to change that. But what I am going to do is inside the program file here, there's a couple of things I've done. So firstly, in my NuGet package dependencies, I've added a dependency on the systems manager um, NuGet package. Then when I'm creating my host builder, this is an ASP.NET Core application, it's one line. Let's just comment that line out. Comment that line out. There we go. That's it. Add systems manager, and then you give it the key, the root key that you want the uh, to fetch the configuration and secrets from as it starts up. And you can have this automatically re um, retrieve on a, a time basis if you want. Um, here it's just using a, a one-time query. And that will inject the values inside that, uh, that, that live underneath that common root into the configuration system of ASP.NET Core. So what I've done is I've added a class here. Now you would normally put um, echo these to the screen, but that's exactly what I'm going to do. I've created a simple C sharp class that represents the settings that are inside that secrets manager, uh, sorry, uh, parameter store key. In fact, let's go and refresh our memory of what those parameters look like. So go back to parameter store and here are the secrets or and plain text configuration values that I'm going to read at runtime. So these correspond to the field names in this class. If I then go to my index file here, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this section of code. And this is how I get pull the values from what's been retrieved um, under the, the common root into that C sharp object that I can then go and work with. Right. Uh, you could just work with them individually from configuration. In this case, I just decided to put them all into a, uh, into a single class. Now, remember that to retrieve secrets in Secrets Manager through the Parameter Store API, I need to use a specific path, slash AWS, slash reference, slash Secrets Manager, and then the secret ID. So that's how I'm going to do it here. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to retrieve the name of the secret from Parameter Store, which in itself is a, is a secured string. And I'm going to just create a service client to uh, Systems Manager. Um, this will be familiar if you've used any of our SDKs. Uh, if you haven't, uh, I'm not going to go into it here, but it's very simple. I'm just creating a .NET class that represents the service. That class has methods on it that represent the APIs of that service. And I'm going to call a particular API called get parameter. And that's going to retrieve for me the value of the secret. It's going to forward that call through to Secrets Manager, get the value of the secret, and then I'm going to echo it to the screen. So on my um, my UI here, as I scroll through to the bottom here, you'll see that uh, I just have a section at the bottom here because the scrolling, but I'm just going to echo all the parameters that I've retrieved. So let's deploy this. And what I'm going to do is actually deploy this to my test environment that I created earlier on. Let's deploy that. And then we'll go and take a look at the role that I set up that I showed you at the very start of the talk and see how it's able to call systems manager and secrets manager. So that's deploying out. 
is now updating the deployed application. So let's go back to my management console, go back into identity and access management, and take a look at the actual role that I'm using, which is very similar to the demo role I set up earlier. Uh, here it is, secret sample role. And remember, this is the one that has the three trust relationships on it and three sets of three policy permissions. So EC2 and S3 policy, we saw those earlier on. I'm going to repeat those. But here's my read secrets policy that I attached. And if I scroll through, you can see that I'm allowing access to get secret value, get parameters by path. This one I absolutely need to, to use that extension library. And I also decide to add get parameter just because I notice that I've scoped down my resources. Now, in this particular case, I'm, I'm allowing it to read any secret and any parameter inside my account. But I could scope this further. I could say this policy only applies to my slash sample secrets route or my particular secret in secrets manager. OK, um, depends on how how locked down you want this to be. Uh, in this particular case, I'm just going to let it read any secret and any parameter that I have. So let's go back to Visual Studio and hopefully we've updated. Yep, done. So let's bring up the application. And there's my S3 buckets and instances that I had earlier on. Take a look at my runtime secrets and here they are. So you can see that it's pulled back. So that call to that extension library of adding the slash secret sample root key has pulled back setting one, setting two, and the two secrets, and you can see here the value of the secrets. Now, obviously, it's ironic, you wouldn't do this in real life. You wouldn't echo the secrets to screen, but it'd be a very dull demo if I just masked out the values. And here's where it used get parameter to read the secrets. So it went to, to parameter store using the get parameter API, using the key path that meant, hey, this is actually in secrets manager, read back the secret, and there's my connection string data to my fake database that I have um, inside. Uh, Amazon RDS. Okay, so that's how we can work with secrets at runtime. It does not have to be tedious, right? If you're a .NET developer, we can make use of extension libraries to do this. It's like I just showed you, it's a one line call. It's really, really easy. Um, and again, if convenient libraries don't exist for your particular language, use the public APIs or maybe contribute a library in that particular language that everyone else can use. Some of you might be sitting thinking, well, that's all, that's all great and such, but my app still uses ASP.NET. Well, okay. Um, there is some code you can pick up. It's not a, an AWS official library by any means. It was a proof of concept by one of our other DAs uh, and solution architects, Kirk Davis, but he put this together. There's a link there to it. You can go and take a look at the code and that gives, lets you to use the same techniques inside an ASP.NET uh, application. So let's finish with a recap. So we went through protecting our credentials, right? Not putting credentials inside our source files or config files. Use a credential profile. Doesn't matter when you deploy if that profile name is inside the code, nobody cares. We're gonna use a role. And that role with the trust relationship will vend credentials. Temporary, automatically rotating credentials. Um, you don't need to deploy credential files. You don't need to put credentials inside your code. And then forget, put them under GitHub or any other public repo like GitLab. Um, Using parameter store from systems manager and secrets manager to get secrets that I'm going to use maybe inside my tooling from the command line and my build systems or at runtime when my application runs. Okay. Um, pull all that data at runtime. It also means that I can easily share that across teams. Um, you know, I'm not running around with a thumb drive with secrets on or, hey, just take this latest configuration data uh, from me. It makes that super, super easy. I'll leave you with some useful links to um, some of our homepages for .NET. Um, the, the second one is really important. That's where you'll find all of our open source extensions. That's where you'll find that Secrets Manager caching library and the Parameter Store extension library, amongst other uh, open source libraries that we have for .NET developers. And there's a couple of courses on there on AWS. Uh, again, if you're a .NET developer, I'll help you get up and running pretty quickly. Don't forget. Uh, we are giving away a Star Wars Lego at the AWS booth, um, so do come along and sign up. Because um, if you know if there are no winners, Bill and I get to fight over who gets to take the Lego home, and I suspect I'll win. Um, being the younger dude, um, but yeah, come and come and sign up. Get yourself a Lego set if you win. And with that, thank you for coming along to the session. I hope you uh, picked up some uh, tips and techniques there that you can use to protect your secrets. Um, feel free to reach out to me there. Um, if there were any questions, I think we only have a few minutes left anyway, um, and Bill hasn't answered them, then feel free to pop along to the lounge. Um, we'll be hanging out there for a little while. Um, I'm happy to chat there.
with that, thanks for listening. <laughs>